Welcome, everyone, to today's Family Business Webinar. My name is Ed Hart with the First Bank Center for Family-Owned Businesses. We're happy to have you with us here today, live from our studios in Irvine, California at Sitch, Sitch Radio. We're very excited about our topic today and talking about family business topics that matter to you, our business owners and leaders. We welcome everyone who's a friend, colleague, or a prospect of the First Bank uh, Center for Family-Owned Businesses. I will get to our speaker here momentarily. Uh, but first, as we do each month, we'd love to show you a brief video featuring our chairman and owner of First Bank, Mike, Michael Deerberg. After the video, I will then introduce our speak, our presenter today, B. Bocalandro, talk a little bit about what we're going to address today. Also, as we always do, if you have any questions uh, in the webinar feature here on Zoom, you can enter in your questions and we will get to those either throughout the presentation or at the end. So without further ado, let's watch this brief video from Michael Deerberg. Family business is so much more than just business as usual. It takes an entirely different mindset, a different vision. You know a bright future is found in strong traditions. You see the freedom in looking further down the road. As part of the fourth generation of my family to help lead First Bank, I know we share your vision. That's why we've created the First Bank Center for Family-Owned Businesses to share our experience with monthly webinars, tailored products, tools, and education specific to family-owned businesses. Your vision is our vision. Let our experience be yours. Let's see what your future can be. As Michael mentioned in the video, First Bank, he didn't mention this by uh, in words, but uh, many of you who have been with us over the months and years of these webinars know that First Bank is a fourth generation privately held family owned business, about 113 years old as we record today. With that, we recognize that there are a lot of aspects to running your family business. And many months we talk more about the technical aspects of leadership and the things that apply to running your business on a day to day. I interviewed our guest today, B. Bocalandro, about two and a half years ago on my podcast. And she made a comment that I'll get to here in a moment. But before I get to that, I'll tell you a little bit about her. B is the author of the Amazon best-selling and critically acclaimed book, Do Good at Work, How Simple Acts of Social Purpose Drive Success and Well-Being. I read that book when she sent it to me back in 2020 and immediately said, we got to have her on the podcast and you're going to know why here momentarily. B is the founder and president of the global purpose advisory firm VeraWorks with clients all over the country, including Federal Express, Aetna, IBM, Toyota, Levi's, Tom's Shoes. Disney, Eventbrite, and many, many more. She's been featured in the Harvard Business Review, on Forbes, media such as Fox and others. And uh, she's been an instructor, professor at Georgetown University, Boston College, University of Nevada, Las Vegas, to name others. As I mentioned, when I had B on the podcast in October of 2020, the From the Heart podcast presented by the First Bank Center for Family-Owned Businesses, a lot of the comments that B made stuck out to me, but one in particular, B, that you mentioned that People want to go home on a Friday night and feel like they've made a difference at work, not mm -hmm. just in their job and in their company, but in their community and in their team around them. Do you find that that really still holds true as kind of a barometer for people feeling like they're doing good at work? This is one of the things I love about you, Ed, is that your questions are so insightful. <laughs> and uh, okay. every conversation I've had with you, I think that was really the first conversation we've had. But since then, uh, I just... I thank you for having me. I just Our love pleasure. conversing with you. So the short answer is yes. When we talked in October, 2020, my book wasn't out, Do Good at Work. And uh, it has since come out. And I think that the reception of the book answers the question. So I think without a doubt, more and more people are now approaching work hoping to do exactly what you said. So to end their work week feeling like, yes, I did something that mattered. You know, my labor was not for entirely for naught. So the question is, how do we do that, right? Yep. There you go. Absolutely. And we're excited to uh, hear your insights and, and hear more about the research that you've done. I know you're a self-proclaimed data nerd. And I know we have a <laughs> lot of people in our audience who are as well. A few names come to mind and I won't mention those by name, but you know who you are. Um, so yeah, talk to us about just your research, the book, and just how really making an impact at work can really, as we as we teed this up on LinkedIn, and as we promoted this webinar, we talked a lot about how 
people want to feel like they're making an impact and they want to engage. And as employers, many family business owners here today mm -hmm. want to find ways to engage their employees. So with that, the, yes. the floor is yours. I'll stay right here and chime in from time to time. Excellent. Well, I promise I won't uh, present too many graphs or get too nerdy on you. So about 10 years ago, I walked into a Washington, D.C., store looking for a snowboarding jacket and the sales assistant was telling me that the jacket I was trying on didn't put any plastic in the ocean because it was a 100% recycled plastic and that it had a low carbon footprint and he told me about these wildlife corridors that are very important for uh saving all these species that uh are you know in danger of going extinct and a wildlife corridor is basically a green path through all the cement that we do in development so that everything from like moose to porcupines to crabs in some cases can get to their habitat. So I had I had never heard of wildlife corridors. Uh, and this was kind of a mini educational environmental education transaction for me. I bought the snowboard jacket and left. What's the big deal? It was just a sales transaction, right? Well, I would say no something remarkable happened in that sales transaction. Let's think about the sales associate. So that sales associate benefited from purpose. Now, I'm not talking about that existential purpose of why am I here on earth? What am I meant to do? There's nothing wrong with pursuing that. And then if you're really lucky, you can get paid to do that. And now you're all set. Now you're sitting down on Friday evening feeling fulfilled. But that's a very difficult path. Not all of us can become surgeons or preachers, which are, by the way, the two top professions that sit down on Friday and feel like, yes, I made a difference. What that sales associate did is a shortcut to purpose that actually rewards us in almost the same way as answering the big purpose with a capital P, say. And that way, that shortcut is simply making meaningful contributions to others or society. Now, if you're skeptical, I don't blame you because this sounds way too simple. So, let me walk through this. Psychologists have amassed ample data showing that meaningful contributions to others or society, whenever we do them, our physiology, this is not conscious, this is entirely subconscious, our physiology rewards us with that uplifting sense of having done something that mattered. And then in retrospect, we consider that act to be meaningful. And by the way, if we feel that an act that we did at work, like that sales associate did, that was a contribution to someone or to a societal cause, it was meaningful, we also feel our life is meaningful. So Ed, to your, there's some footnotes here <laughs> to, uh, to live up to my nerdiness. So all of this is totally backed by science and you can see you can see the footnotes there. Now, when we make this meaningful contribution through work, then that's what's called job purposing. That's what I have dubbed job purposing. And that's what that sales associate was doing. It turns out that when we job purpose, our happiness goes up. So this isn't just like, oh, I'm so much happier. I, I know I'm happier. I, I feel I'm happier. I'm reporting I'm happier. But literally, oxytocin, dopamine, serotonin, these are the happy hormones that make sex and chocolate wonderful. They go up. So that sales associate was really like benefiting from a natural doping. And by the way, this doesn't just last minutes or hours. It usually lasts days. And some Canadian research finds that it lasts weeks, that happiness boost. But it also improves our health. So if we had measured the T cells of that sales associate from having done this job purposing, the T, -shell T cells were probably more effective. And this is based on research done at Harvard but also less likely to suffer from depression, 
if that sales associate suffered from some sort of chronic pain, like a back pain or something, and normally reported it to be an eight, miraculously, it goes like, oh, you know what? It's kind of five. It's a five today. And he'll have no idea that it's because he did that small act of job purposing. But scientists have found this to be true. And also, he's more likely to be successful. So the job feels more satisfying. His level of engagement is higher. Uh, productivity is over 20% higher. Performance is likely to be higher, more likely to get a, a raise, more likely to get a, a promotion. And this research comes by actually very well done studies at the University of Chicago. So Ed, let me put you on the spot here. Um, does this ring true in your work working with companies that those that are Focus on having a culture where employees can contribute to something meaningful uh, tend to have more positive cultures and employees tend to be happier and maybe healthier. You know, I do see it and there's several companies that come to mind and without naming names or pointing out specific yeah. examples, I'm a pretty good judge of, of when people are happy or not because I've been on the other side where I haven't been. So I can kind of see it. You and I talked about this in the podcast a couple of years ago, I remember as well, but yeah, a few that come to mind. I mean, it's it's easy for me to tell when I see employees like we're sitting at the Sitch Radio Studios on campus at Antis Roofing, as an example here in Irvine. I, I've gotten to know Charles Antis very well over the years. Some of you know who he is. You've, we've had him on podcasts and, and so forth here with the bank. Um, but I know a lot of his employees and I can tell that they're very engaged yeah. in what they do because of how he engages not only as a leader, but as he engages the community and people come in here for blood drives and for lots of different community mm -hmm. events. But yeah, I can definitely tell when I when I walk into a company, I can tell if they are a socially intentional or accidental yeah. company just yeah. by looking at the faces on the employees. Yes. So. And I, I mean, I, I, I figured you would because uh, you're so perceptive. And I, I think Charles Antis is a great example. So great, actually, that um, he's, he's in the book. He's in the book. <laughs> so page 142. And I even drew Charles. I don't know if the camera can uh, come here. But um, but yeah, so I, I think that that's a fantastic example. And you do once you start as a manager, once you start paying attention to this, it, it starts becoming really obvious. And to the point where sometimes as a customer, I'll be at a certain business uh, and then I'll go, I I detect what you're detecting that, wow, there seems to be a bounce in their step and they're this. And so then I'll go do research on the All web right. nerd that I am. Yes. <laughs> and, and, um, and sure enough, when you do the research, it's just like this is this is a business that has prioritized making sure that employees have it doesn't have to be every day, but every week, maybe have a way of doing something that they consider to be meaningful. So just to give you an example of how dramatic. Job purposing is, is if we this is research done by Morton Hansen at UC Berkeley and the thousands and thousands of employees, he was looking at what makes people uh, perform better, you know, what leads to high performance. And one of the things he found is that if our jobs lack purpose, we perform on average at the bottom 10%. If we have purpose, we jump to well above 64, uh, well above average. So these are not small effects. That, that, that bulleted list I gave you, these are large effects out there that purpose has on us. It, one way to look at it is that once you take care of the bottom of, you know, Maslow's pyramid of needs of pay and perks and safety and that sort of stuff, and, you know, you're, you're paying your rent and you're, 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 you're feeling safe and all of that, purpose is the greatest driver of workplace well-being. This is per research done at the University of Dallas and the Happiness Research Institute in Copenhagen and elsewhere. So how do we do this? You know, I, I I loved hearing from readers. And these are two readers, uh, uh, my version of them, <laughs> my drawing, uh, in Pennsylvania. And apparently the wife of one of them gave them my audio book and they decided, well, okay, we'll, we'll start listening to it uh, because, you know, we kind of have to. But they it sounds like they got through the entire book and their job is to go from construction site to construction site. They're construction workers. And one of the things they realized was while they were listening to my book was like, you know what? We 
go to a Dunkin' Donuts or not to pick on Dunkin' Donuts, but on, on to a coffee shop in the middle of the afternoon for a coffee break. And actually it's a little redundant because we carry thermoses with coffee. So uh, what? instead of doing that, why don't we just stop on the side of the road where there's all this illegal dumping, get a little bit of exercise, throw a few TVs in and couches. And then we're a construction company. We know how to get rid of solid waste. And they started doing this and they said they love it. And um, that's why they contacted me. They're like, you know, thank you for the idea. I didn't give them the idea. They just, you know, found it themselves. But the point is that you wouldn't think that the, you know, a construction job would be a great place to do something where you do end up on Friday feeling like you made a meaningful contribution out there. But they found a way. A completely different example is HP. This is a client. And they offered to their employees, their sales uh, team in particular, they said, hey, at HP, we're really, really environmentally responsible. We know how to lower the carbon footprint. We know how to reduce solid waste, how to reduce energy costs. So why don't we offer to our sales team that we'll train you on these business practices, like how to help a business with these business practices, and you become an eco-advocate. And then uh, when you go out to sell our new cloud product, you can also offer to those businesses, hey, by the way, we can help you lower your carbon footprint, lower your solid waste, lower your electricity costs. Would you like help with that? And I'm fortunate that I was the person who got to analyze the data on the employee engagement. And sure enough, those who had access to eco advocates, because it only it started in Canada. So originally, most sales associates didn't have access to it. Those who had access to it and pursued it had much higher levels of engagement than those that didn't. And by the way, it was so successful for the company that it went global. So these are two examples of job purposing. And you might be thinking, okay, really? Like if you're anything like my, the college students I teach, you might be thinking, really be? Such small contributions are gonna have such a large impact. I don't think so. Well, I, I believe me, I was as surprised as anybody, but the answer is yes. It turns out that just five minutes, one, one book found that 50 seconds of an empathic conversation with someone else has all these impacts. And it, by the way, on the recipient as well. So yes, the all these bullet points that I showed you on this positive impact, most of these forms of job purposing were super small. I'm talking about some of these studies on happiness, for example, higher reported happiness in the person doing the job purposing, all they were doing was like bringing a beverage to a colleague in, in the middle of the afternoon. Very normal everyday acts. The trick is to fold them into work. So there's a whole bunch of other examples. There's over a hundred in the book. And by the way, I am going to share a way that all of you, well, as long as you're in the U.S., it's a little pricey if it's outside of the U.S., but if you're in the U.S., you you can get a free book. So um, there's over a hundred examples in the book. I'm not going to go through all of these examples, but if you're a CEO, there's a way to job purpose. If you're a designer of surfboards, there's a way to job purpose. Why not put a sensor in the fin that relays information to scientists trying to save our oceans? Now, every time you sell a fin, you're helping to preserve oceans for generations to come. So you get the idea. There's lots of examples of job purposing. Um, Ed, anything you would like uh, jump in and say at this point? You know, I like that. It, I like that you're encouraging people to kind of think outside the box. When I read that example of the fin on the surfboard as an example, that made a really big impact on me. There are so many ways, and I'd love to encourage our audience to think of new creative ways. And I'd be happy to sit down with anyone with B or with you to come up with some new and creative ways of of making an impact outside the box. I mean, I love the idea of the construction workers stopping and picking up you know, recyclable or items that are on the side of the road, just because they have the facilities, they have the knowledge and and the expertise of what to do with it. So those yeah. are great examples. Yeah. And, you know, one thing I would like to, to share, if you're listening to this going like, what's wrong with me? I can't 
I can't find a way to job purpose. It's simple, but it's not necessarily easy to come up with the ideas. So, uh, and, and you know, this is one one reason I have a day job. So I'll just say that give yourself a few weeks to come up with the idea to like something that works for you. And during those few weeks, every day, think to yourself a few times a day, whatever I'm doing right now, is there a way to do it that is like more charitable, that is more green, that is more inclusive? So, and soon you'll, and so I, I can't claim any credit for the, 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 the surfboard designer who came up with that idea, but I suspect that it was just like one day he was like, well, oh, there's these scientists trying to, you know, put thermometers in the ocean and I have something that's in the ocean. You know, he just kind of connected the dots. But I, I assure you, it probably wasn't his first day on the job or the first day that he felt like he wanted his job to be more of a contribution. So give yourself a few weeks. And then during that time, at random times, maybe set up, on, set up an alarm that goes off and they'll say, whatever I'm doing right now, is there a way to do it so that it's job purposing? So let's say you're buying supplies. You're, you're doing something really boring. You're buying paper for the printer. And, I'll, and if you ask yourself that question, is there a way to make this so that this is job purposing? You might go, well, by God, yeah, I could buy recycled paper or I could buy recycled from a minority business or from a, a, a local small business. And the ways to job purpose will emerge, but don't be don't be hard on yourself. It's simple, but not necessarily easy to begin with. So again, there are over a hundred examples in the book, uh, Do Good at Work, How Simple Acts of Social Purpose Drive Success and Well-Being. I'm going to give you a free way to get the book. So this, I just did this last week. I, 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 I read one piece too many of depressing news and I thought I got to do something <laughs> to cheer people up. So I was like, well, what if I give away uh, books? And this is designed so you can get a free book for yourself and then you can get a free book for to give away. And I did that deliberately because I know, as I've already presented, that giving something away, giving a gift makes the recipient feel great. I want those who participate to feel the oxytocin and the serotonin and the dopamine. So this is done done like this deliberately. So if you're listening to this uh, within certainly within days, but weeks of the of of the original airing, I do have this offer. Take advantage of it. All you have to do is go to do good at work and then answer, just find the place, answer a few questions, and we'll send you two books. And again, there's many, many examples there of job purposing. And by the way, I love hearing from readers, new examples. If you want a free resource, uh, another free resource that has kind of the management version of job purposing, uh, the Harvard Business Review printed um, an, art, an article that I wrote, uh, Why Your Values Belong at Work. Obviously, that's free or accessing it is free. So uh, that might be helpful as well. I also have a TEDx that gets the, the key information out on that's in the book about job purposing. So you're welcome to go there. And there's like lots of resources as well uh, on my website. You can sign up for my newsletter. I have blogs and offers and all sorts of things. So just go to dogoodatwork.com. So one question that comes up a lot is that, wait, B, I've been focusing on having my team members just do the work that they love. So I run a marketing firm and the graphic designers, that's what they love doing. They love drawing, they love designing. And so isn't that enough? They're doing what they love. Shouldn't they love their job? And I don't blame people for asking this because we have been brought up to believe this. We have been brought up like, if you choose the career that you love, you'll never work another day in your life. But the research actually is finding that that's actually not good advice. 
back to Morton Hansen at the U at university at, at UC Berkeley. So remember that if, um, so if you, if, if you have a job that lacks purpose, right? You're at the bottom 10%, remember? Let's say that you add passion and you're like, you're doing what you love. You're flying the planes, you're designing the, the, the dresses, whatever it is that you love doing. Well, yes, your performance is going to go up by only 10%. So you're still near rock bottom at 20%. So really you're better off doing a job that you don't particularly like the tasks, but that does good for the world or for others, then you are choosing that craft that you love doing, like taking photographs or whatever that is. Um, Ed, back to you. Any any uh, re reactions to that? You know, I'm thinking of an example of a company that I know that gives out gift cards to their employees to go do good, like a Starbucks card or an yeah. In-N-Out gift card or what have you. So, hey, I trust that you're not going to use this yourself, but I trust that when you're in the drive-thru or walking up to the line, you're going to give this to the person in line behind you. Oh, and I love that idea. It's a nice way that they, and there's no you know, the employees can come back and tell the story of what they did. Oftentimes you don't know the story. I've bought co coffee for the person in line behind me at Starbucks. I don't know their story or their situation. I just know that if my employer gave me that, yes, it, it's not a hint to First Bank. I love what I'm doing at First Bank, yeah. but there are a lot of companies out there who do things like that to really yeah. engage their employees more. So be, yeah. again, the out-of-the-box thinking ways that you can engage your team, I think is really important. Right. Yeah, that's a brilliant uh, strategy. In fact, it's one that Charles Antis uses. So the employees who are recognized for being great employees, whatever it was, you know, they worked more hours or they did something exceptional. What they get is a charitable contribution gift card. Right. And so they get to give it to the organization that they would like to. And then, as you said, Ed, What's brilliant about this is, I mean, that's already brilliant because already remember oxytocin, dopamine, all this stuff, and it's it's that is job purposing. But additionally, to your point, when they come back and they're invited to share who they gave that charitable contribution to, and um, and that brings all this humanity into the workplace because someone will say, well, I gave it to a sports organization because when I was 12 years old, my parents were getting divorced and I was just feeling so lost. And it was a coach who got me through those years. And so now you have this infusion into the workplace of this very meaningful connection that, that goes around. And by the way, when you job purpose and when you when you move forward job purposing as a manager, I, the book has eight drivers that makes it more powerful, but the most powerful driver, the best thing you can do is make it shared, make it. So instead of helping that one person figure out how at their job by themselves, they can make a meaningful contribution, have that be more of a collective experience because all those benefits that happen, the higher satisfaction, the engagement, the retention, all those benefits, they they go, they, they're augmented if it's a shared job purposing. One question uh, that almost everybody asks me when I talk about, well, yeah, it's going to improve the lives of your employees and improve the culture at your organization, but does this actually make it all the way down to the bottom line? So we have really good data now on this. Finally, it's taken probably like 15 years, but there's there's a number of academic studies and now there's a number of uh, meta analysis studies, which is when an academic looks at all the different studies and figures out what they all say together. And we can, pretty much conclude that as long as it's done reasonably well, and again, it doesn't have to be done perfectly, but reasonably well, you can count on job purposing improving recruitment. So one study, for example, found that 35% more people applied to a job that, uh, that made contributions to others. Productivity goes up and retention goes up. 
you can also uh, you can also count on sales going up. So not only because the employees are higher performing, but actually I, okay, so that jacket that I bought <laughs> 10 years ago or about 10 years ago, that snowboarding jacket, it was a little pricey. Um, I don't think I would have bought it. Uh, I would have paid as much as I paid for it had I not also had that oxytocin and the serotonin and all that stuff because I felt like the transaction was helpful. So there's more and more evidence now that uh, consumers are looking at information about products to make decisions and job purposing can make your product look more attractive. So just one example, about 10 years ago, 25% of consumers would do research on the environmental impact of a product before buying it. And it's now 50%. So this can be a really powerful way to differentiate. Have you have you seen this, Ed? In the Absolutely. I mean, people feel loyal to feelings and stories. Yes. And I, I see these advertisements on TV or or wherever I I take in media. And the stories are more important to me than the product themselves. Right. I, we, people buy into the story. They buy right. into the feeling to your points. Yes. And I think that's what we're trying to create. That's yeah. what we're trying to create here at the center as yeah. well. We're trying to create that feeling of, hey, we're we're interested in you more than just as a potential bank client. We're interested in you and the entire entirety of your business. Yeah. Where are you giving? Where are you? We, that's why we have the Center for Family-Owned Businesses. It's to educate these families, to give them a that positive feeling of, of who we are more than just what we can provide for them financially. Yeah. Um, I love that. And you know, the other side of that is that it actually protects you. So if, if your customers, and this goes for B2B customers too, as well, if your customers know that you, that your business stands for something more than just making a profit they will actually be more forgiving. So yeah, you got to love academics. They One experiment they did is they set up like a barista station and a coffee station. And half the people knew that this, this coffee company, you know, this non-existent, but existent for the, for the research coffee company uh, did you know, good things out there for the community. Frankly, I can't remember what they were. The other half didn't, the other customer, the other half of customers and the, the, but the service was terrible, right? So they got your name wrong. The beverages were cold. Um, they, they, they would put sugar in when you ask no sugar, you know, they basically deliberately uh, messed up every order. And those customers that knew that this business was about more than just selling a cup of coffee at a profit, A, they were much more forgiving. They would go like, yeah, it's not that hot, but actually that's probably good because it's kind of a hot day. Like they would find the silver lining. And this is not conscious. This is subconscious. They're not making the decision of, okay, I know this business is doing good. So I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to not be uh, negative about it. This is all happening sub subconscious. The other thing is that they were much less likely to like go on social media and write the angry tweet. Like, can you believe that I waited 20 minutes for my beverage? But those that didn't know that the business was about more than, you know, like had kind of all those positive feelings was about more than just making a profit um did do both of those they complained they told others they went on social media and um said bad things about the business so it's actually a protective factor as well and yes bottom line yes your bottom line well, obviously it, it will do better there's a, there's a resource on my website do good at work um, about that summarizes this this data, but also chapter 10 uh, of the book summarizes all this data as well. So in summary, there's a shortcut to workplace purpose. You as a manager, whatever business you're in, 
you can help your employees benefit from purpose. The shortcut is called job purposing. And it's basically any way you can find to have your team members make a meaningful contribution to others or society. Job purposing matters because once we have met our basic needs, purpose is the greatest driver of well of well-being in the workplace. Passion can't make up for purpose. So people confuse these terms all the time. Per Morton Hansen's research, if you have passion, and that is defined as doing what you love, it does not substitute for a lack of purpose. You can do something you love, but if you don't feel it's a meaningful contribution, you're still going to be at that bottom 20% of performance. Now, of course, that's an average. So maybe you can beat it. You know, some people do. Obviously, that's an average. Some people perform higher. Some people perform lower. But but the point is you're setting yourself up for failure. It's like you're you're fueling yourself with like really low grade fuel to go out there and work and be successful. Job purposing does drive business results. And I'm, I have a couple more points around the summary to make. One is that a question I get often is like, okay, this seems like a modern tactic to do to our workplaces. But in fact, it's not. It's an ancient legacy that we have as humans. Our forebearers didn't hunt game for and then go back to their hut and share it only with their spouse and their 2.4 kids. Our forebearers would hunt game and bring it back for the tribal feast. Our prehistoric forebearers didn't collect berries and say, okay, we have enough for us. They would continue gathering berries until they had enough for their neighbors as well. So our prehistoric ancestors, their work was inherently job purposed. That's what anthropologists are now finding. And in fact, because of that, it felt so good that they didn't even have a word for work. Work was the same thing as leisure. It was the same thing as playing games with your neighbors. It was it was just part of the fabric of a of a of a fulfilling life. It wasn't like they didn't have this work life balance. Like I can't work too much because it takes away from 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 life. It was actually an activity that they enjoyed doing so much that actually it wasn't even like compulsory. Like if you woke up one day and you're like, you know what, I'm feeling a little bit tired. I'm not going to go to work. The way the tribe interpreted that was like, you know what. I woke up um, feeling a little bit tired. I'm not going to go to my neighbor's, um, you know, birthday party. Like there was no obligation to work. So uh, um, job purposing is your evolutionary legacy. And it really is the legacy of everybody that works at your business. And so why not claim this legacy, right? Any thoughts on this? Yeah, just you've got me thinking. So when you and I spoke in 2020, mm -hmm. we were kind of on the front end of this pandemic and the front end of a lot of people starting to go out and do a lot of other things outside of the box. Companies that I know a company that delivered produce through furniture delivery vans because they combined their yes. sources and went out and delivered, especially to elderly people, Yes, things that didn't exist prior to 2020. Yeah, Are you finding that companies are more socially purposeful, I guess, to, to coin a phrase, now than maybe we were a couple of years ago because of the pandemic? Yes, although not as much as one would hope. So I have had executives basically say, I miss the pandemic because the pandemic allowed me to do what I've always wanted to do. And it's like, no one was looking at the quarterly returns. We knew they were going to be awful. <clears throat> and I was able to just focus on contributing through my company. And now we're back to 
you know, what are the Q2 earnings and are you going to meet your, sure. you know, your projections? So I think the there's no question that all the hardship on businesses through the pandemic and the lockdown ignited this interest in managers at all levels to use businesses as a platform for doing good and for really kind of recapturing that that same feeling of that of the examples you gave of wow we are like a vital part of society we can do something meaningful so i think that's true at the regular individual contributor level the employee level there's also no question about that. So the, the great resignation, Edelman, global research found that the number one reason people were quitting their jobs was lack of purpose. Mm -hmm. The problem with quitting your job, though, because of lack of purpose is that unfortunately, most off the shelf jobs aren't inherently job purposed yet. We'll get there. <laughs> That's right. So what's going to happen is your next job is also not going to have purpose. And so and we can't all go become surgeons or preachers. You you don't want me removing your appendix. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, um, yeah. So I think that we have been awakened to how much better it is to have our work week be meaningful, give us a sense of mattering, but we're still kind of struggling to find a way to get there. And of course, there are constraints. I mean, you, the, the reality is that businesses do need to report quarterly or, you know, report if you're, you're, you're not publicly traded, you still have shareholders to report to. And, you know, they could be family members or they could be investors. So there are constraints to doing this. And the the trick is like how to move forward with those constraints. And so I think that that's, that's a lot of my work now is advising uh, executives on how to balance these things and, and how to move forward. But I, there's no question that there's a lot more interest in having business do good. Let's talk about the termite effect for a minute that is starting from the ground up. So you work with these executives Talk to the employees for a minute who might be watching today or as we record this and put it out on our website later on who want to make an impact through their work, but they're not getting that support from above. What what yeah. advice would you give to them to try to push this up the food chain? Yes. So really, the book is for you. And again, if you're watching this uh any you know sometime near when we recorded it uh you can get a free book so the book was written for you because basically after 15 years of helping businesses do good i realized that there were a, a whole lot of employees that wanted to do good but they didn't want to wait for their business to get their act together so the good news is that once i started looking into it there are hundreds of examples of employees doing what's on your mind right now? Like, how can I push my the limits of my job or just redo it differently so that it is a meaningful contribution? There are ways, whatever job you have, I promise you there are ways for you to make it a contribution. So give yourself again, a couple of weeks, a, a couple of weeks of of exploring that question whatever I'm doing right now, is there a way to do it differently so that it is a contribution? Also, there's nothing wrong with job purposing to benefit your coworkers. So some of the best job purposing I've seen is the, the woman who every time there's a new hire, like basically adopts them for two weeks. And when it, wherever she's going to lunch, where whatever coffee she's getting, she's like, Hey, Joe, can I, I'm going to go get a mocha. Do you want to come with me or can I bring it? I'm, I'm, by the way, I'm going into this meeting. It would be good for you to meet this person. Can I, can I send you the login so that you can attend? Just basically that helping your coworkers is a form of job purposing. It will give you all those, those benefits that, you know, helping to save the oceans does as well. So there's nothing wrong with looking there first. And then if 
you know, if if after a few weeks of doing this, you're still struggling, contact me. I, I actually mm -hmm. love challenges and I love hearing from people who are trying to do this. So contact me and I, I promise we'll, we'll, we'll help you. So I'm going, I haven't talked about one thing about job purposing and sure it helps with your happiness. It helps with your health. It helps with your success. It helps your business uh, do better, but it also, it turns out that it gives you the ability and the courage to do these superhuman tricks. And so I, I, this is me with, actually, this is not the jacket I bought in the, in the first picture, because here's another way to job purpose. So this particular business, when, you're, when your garment runs out, they repaired it twice, and then it was pretty much ir irreparable. Uh, they take it back and then they recycle it, donate it, do something that's very environmentally sustainable plus charitable, and they give you a credit towards a new jacket. So the jacket I'm wearing here is the next generation jacket. This is just uh, maybe last year or two years ago, maybe. So this is me. And because of purpose in my life, look at what at the trick that I am manage to do so here i go here i go i'm picking up speed picking up speed watch watch closely because this trick is incredible watch this <laughs> yes so purpose doesn't help with everything but it does help with many things and good luck on your purpose journey we do have a comment on here from a friend of mine, Mitch Siegel, who I've known for 20 years and pardon the glasses here for me able to read this. He says, I've been working in the world of cause marketing over the past 45 years, having my clients engaging in community needs to get added exposure for their businesses. I see job purposing as a way to get this effort for good beyond the marketing department that brings up the idea. Thanks, Mitch, for that comment. Um, and I owe you lunch. Uh, we've been talking about that. How can we engage our clients? in social purpose and we've talked about internally yeah. we've talked about bringing coffee to my coworker, taking them to a meeting yes the trickle up effect if you will yes what are some good ways that you've seen companies yes. successfully engage their their clientele or their community yeah and i love that comment so uh cause marketing is you're marketing your whatever your business does but now you're marketing it in a way that also benefits a societal cause. So the one that we've all seen is what they call point of sale, uh, you know, donation. So you round know, you're at the yeah, thing. round up. Yeah. That that that's one. But there are some really sophisticated ways to to cause market, and so cause marketing is also a way to job purpose because you you're taking the marketing function and you're you're playing with it so that it is a meaningful contribution involving customers or clients is one of like my favorite things to do it's a little bit uh beyond where where the typical practices are but i love the question and i love the idea of leveraging that so Levi's, as you mentioned, is one of my clients and they're not doing this anymore, but for years they had 501 day, you know, so 501, that's their iconic, most iconic gene, right? And uh, it was on um, May 1st and they would, they would basically say, Hey, put on your Levi's and then come volunteer with us. And it would be, you know, the employees and the customers volunteering together. So that is something that most, something like that most businesses can do is just invite your customers to come and participate with you. And one of the things that's amazing is that I was talking actually uh, to the someone in the marketing department about that event. And one of the things she said was like, it turns out it's the perfect focus group <laughs> because <laughs> Everybody, it, it, she goes, we pay all this money for focus groups. So we'll, people will like, we'll put people in, in a, in a room and we'll show them different images of people wearing 501 jeans and which ones it makes it more likely for them to, to, to buy one. 
And, you know, people, you know, they're there for the 25 bucks or for the pizza or whatever it is that we give them. But when you have customers doing something meaningful, and now you're contributing to their life, remember, this is a contribution to them. When you have customers doing something meaningful and sharing that with you, they'll you they'll volunteer all sorts of stuff. They'll say, like, I don't understand why these these jeans don't you know, you guys don't make jeans in like army green. Now army green is totally in and she'll go like, ding, let me go talk to the R, you know, the R and D people. So, um, that's one simple way to do it is just do something where you invite your customers. And of course it can be something that's online as well. One, um, business Royal neighbors, they're an insurance company. And one thing I love that they do is that they'll collect stories from their, customers on the good they're doing or the good that they want to do and they will give them small grants to pull it off if it's an idea so if there's a customer that is like i'm hoping to you know set up a dog park in my community because there are none and the dogs you know don't have uh and i need you know seven hundred dollars it's like they will give them the it's uh cash to help them do that. So that's another kind of simple way of involving customers. Now, there, if you're a B2B, uh, maybe there's a way you can help the, the business that you're selling to be better. So you maybe you, let's say that you have, uh, you offer financial products. And if you offer a product that is, um, you know, low carbon footprint or that supports small local businesses or that supports veterans, for example, if that's one of the investment options, now you can sell that to your business customers or whoever your, you know, that investment option. So um, helping another business be more purpose driven is, is, is something to look at. Excellent. Thank you. Are we at the end? I think we're at the end. We're at the and, end. And it's well, been wonderful to no, talk B, to you it's, again. It's, it's always great to see you. We've run into each other in the community and at events and so forth. And it's uh, great to run into you intentionally now and have you here today. Our hope when we do these webinars is that you will find even just one idea, if not many, and I know there were many today, that you can take back into your job, your company, your family business it's imperative and important and critical to us at the Center for Family-Owned Businesses at First Bank that you find ways to further engage your employees, to engage your community. We want you to be successful. That's why we exist. Your success is all that we really think about. So when we bring people in like B to present and give ideas on how you can engage your teams and, and in your community more. We hope you take this as seriously as we do. We know that there are a lot of things you could have done with this last hour. We appreciate those of you who joined us today and those who will join us in the future as we put this up on the First Bank website so that you can access this information. Again, the book that B has talked about, I encourage you to take her up on her offer. I've read the book. I've shared the book. I have a habit, and I love that you're doing this, B, because I have a habit. When I give a book to someone, I always give two because I want you to have it, and oh. I want you to have someone. I want you to have the opportunity to give it to someone else as well. So if you don't have the website, again, do good at work.com or you can contact me or go on the First Bank site and we'll have that information for you as well. Next month, we hope you'll join us in July on the 18th of July at noon Pacific time. Uh, JK Murphy will be presenting about how to really value your company. Now, we know most of you are not looking to sell your company and that's not the point of this webinar either. It's really to get ideas and understand tools and resources that are out there for you to understand the value of your family business to your team, the value to your next generation, the value to your stakeholders, to the community. What do your competitors think about your business? What are your customers saying about you and your company? So we invite you to join us July 18th for our next webinar uh, for the, from the First Bank Center for Family-Owned Businesses. And again, on behalf of the entire First Bank team, B, I'd like to thank you for your time today, for your knowledge and expertise, and for being here with us today. To Brian Colburn and the Sitch Radio team here in Irvine for producing this, and most importantly to you, our guests and our friends for First Bank. Thank you for being with us today, and we wish you a wonderful week.